Sit down. Welcome, that's Margot Leverett, thank you. What a joyous day, what an opportunity for me to uh, stand on the bima here again and as we uh, uh, ordain Karen Cashman. Karen Levine. Karen, Karen, Karen Cashman surprised me, she flew up from Florida. Um, so you have little programs. And we're going to welcome each other with a song now. If you don't have little programs, there's a la 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 part. La 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 part. Of my brothers and friends, for the sake of my sisters and friends, I will sing this song, this song of prayer. Peace to you. This is the house, the house of God. I ask the best for you. This is the house, the house of God. I ask the best for you. Ya la 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 Lie, 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 lie,
My brothers and friends, for the sake of my sisters and friends, I will sing this song, this song of prayer. Peace to you. So welcome everyone. It's good to have a happy day. I want to speak for a few minutes, both to set the stage for what we're all going to witness, and I mean witness in the most active sense. We're all witnessing this beautiful occasion. Uh, and then to talk a little bit about Karen reaching this occasion, so that we we're prepared at that point to do this, the ritual that will ordain her um, as a rabbi. So the term rabbi does not exist in the Torah. The rabbis emerge in the centuries before the Common Era as the scribes, interpreters, and teachers of Torah. So rav means master or teacher. Rabbi literally means my master or my teacher, rabbi. The rabbis would pass on the mantle of master through a process of apprenticeship, study, and practice. This was long before the very modern concept of rabbinic seminaries. Uh, professional schools as a whole are completely modern creations. Apprenticeship was the way of the world for until the modern time. So the old way was to transmit the authority of the office via a laying on of hands. It was understood that the newly ordained rabbi was joining a chain of transmission. In fact, an unbroken chain of transmission dating back to our original teacher, Moses, who, as you might be familiar, is referred to in our tradition as Moshe Rabbeinu, meaning Moses, our rabbi. Um, hence the opening teaching of Pirkei Avot. Pirkei Avot is the teachings of the sages, the eternally wise collection of axioms of the early rabbinic leaders of Judaism. And they open there, that book opens with this statement. Moshe kibel Torah me Sinai, u mesara li shoa, vi shoa le skenim, u skenim le neviim, u neviim masruha l'anshe chneset ha Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua, and Joshua transmitted it to the elders, and the elders transmitted it to the prophets, and the prophets transmitted it to the members of the great assembly, the early rabbinic body, the earliest rabbinic body. The rest of the quote says, the great assembly taught three things. Be deliberate and careful in the administration of justice, raise up many disciples, and make a fence around the Torah, which meant keep people far from transgression. So I want us to pause and reflect for a moment that we are participating today in a ritual that connects us with thousands of unbroken years of Jewish history. It's big. What a privilege to be part of this ancient, ongoing, and noble Jewish story. I am awed to be present at this moment and participating in this way. 
it is important to always be aware that we have survived and Judaism has survived through all these centuries, centuries, millennia, not because of our rigidly adhering to the past, but because of our amazing creativity and ability to adapt our traditions to changing circumstances without abandoning our roots. And so today we witness a contemporary version of this ancient ceremony of smicha, ordination. It is no small thing that today we are ordaining a woman as a rabbi. And that the rabbis assembled here with me as our beit in our tribunal, are also They're all women, and they're all rabbis. <laughs> Rabbi Miriam Markles, <laughs> Rabbi Karen Tashman, <laughs> Rabbi Ellen Trebwasser, and Rabbi Sarah Noyevitz. Our decision as modern Jews to include women in a chain of authority that has historically only been the provenance of males is a signal example of uh, us adapting, our ability to adapt ancient ways to contemporary understandings of equality and access. I'm proud to be part of this change. So the term smicha, which is what this ritual is called, comes from the Hebrew word verb samach. Now it's not samach like sameach, but this is a happy occasion. Sameach, sameach comes from the root for joy. That's sin mem chet. This is samech mem chaf. So it's, it just sounds the same, which is good. Um, smicha means, the smoch means to lean on and also to rely upon. In the sense, you know, lean on me, that reliant idea, but also physically lean upon. So when we place our hands on Karen shortly, we are leaning our hands on her in that meaning of the term. But by giving smicha to Karen, we're also proclaiming that the Jewish community can rely on her, that Karen is a deeply worthy candidate for the title of teacher and leader in the Jewish community. So here are just a few of the reasons why I do not hesitate to declare Karen our rabbi. And I wrote some of these previously. You'll, you might have heard them. I met Karen close to 30 years ago when she brought her daughter Alex to the WJC Family School. And as with many WJC parents, Karen's interest in Judaism was reignited through Alex's and her participation in our family school. And with Karen's background in Hebrew and her musical aptitude, Karen became one of our Bimitzvah tutors. Our younger daughter, Nomi, our younger, my young, Ellen and my younger daughter, Nomi, was one of her students. And Nomi had a tremendous experience working with Karen, uh, who, among other traits as a teacher, maintains high standards and expectations for her students. <laughs> it's a good quality. I won't. Karen became a regular Torah chanter at our Shabbat services. Karen joined the ritual committee and after some time became chairperson. In this capacity, Karen managed the process of beautifying our sanctuary. She gets a lot of credit. Um, soliciting design proposals for our ark and Torah table to local craftspeople, choosing the winning design, overseeing its installation. Karen began organizing the high holiday services with me a long time ago. She took charge of reaching out to our teen Torah readers and nurturing those relationships. I relied heavily on Karen's prodigious technical and computer skills, but I also relied on Karen's keen aesthetic sensibilities and trusty intuition. We spent hours every year exploring the phrases from Torah that matched with gematria, the numerology of the upcoming Jewish year, choosing the themes for each high holidays group aliyot. 
I came to look to Karen for feedback on all of my ideas for adult education topics and Torah study. While Karen preferred to remain in the background, she has been a genuine partner and collaborator in my rabbinic work for many years. Through her involvement in the ritual committee, Karen became involved in the Ulster County Hevra Kadisha, becoming a go-to person in arranging for the Jewish rituals of preparing the body for burial. She has continued to fill this role. Karen began bringing her hand drums to services to accompany our prayers and songs. I have never felt more supported by a musician. Karen is such a sensitive listener and talented drummer that she knew just how and when to insert a beat and when to be silent and wait. This ability to listen sensitively is a quality that extends far beyond the realm of music. In 2013, when I wanted to make a CD of the music of the Woodstock Jewish Congregation in honor of my upcoming 25th anniversary celebration, I turned to Karen. She and I co-produced that album. It was a joy to work with her. When I had completed the manuscript for my book of Torah commentaries, I turned to Karen, and we worked together on content, on editing, on page layouts, on design. I could not have produced that book without Karen's assistance and collaboration. And then, of course, when COVID hit, Karen and I were the team that made a Zoom congregation work. As I figured out how to lead a service on Zoom, Karen figured out the tech. We put in countless hours together, creating what I consider to be one of the most successful Zoom congregations around during the pandemic, all on a shoestring budget. And remember, remember, please, Karen did all this as a volunteer. It is not an, ex an exaggeration to say that Karen is a Renaissance woman. I think we all know that. Her breadth of talents is staggering. I won't try to list them all here. And even more impressive, when Karen wants to learn a new skill, a musical instrument, an art form, she just rolls up her sleeves and learns it. That's how she picked up the clarinet, became a klezmer musician. That's how she became a Zoom maven. That's how she gained the qualifications to be ordained as a rabbi here today. I am awed by her intelligence and her ability to solve problems and to learn new skills. Yeah, yeah, you, you just to sit there. <laughs> and, and now, soon she can push me off the beam up. She's not rabbi yet, right? <laughs> and, and now, Karen has heard the call to become a rabbi. She first spoke with me about this many months ago. This feels like an organic fruition of all the Jewish leadership skills she has practiced over the past 30 years. After leading the congregation from behind the scenes for so many years, and more recently being part of the leadership team, Karen is now ready to step out front and become the synagogue's spiritual leader. I'm thrilled. We are, shall we say, in a stormy time of overwhelming challenges for Jewish communities. Despite its best and really solid efforts, and through no fault of its own, the WJC did not succeed in finding a rabbi ready to move to Woodstock and take over leadership. How fortunate then that we have Karen, <laughs> our, our homegrown <laughs> gift, who knows and loves us deeply and has heard the call to take on the challenges that we face. There's a famous Hasidic story recounted in Martin Buber's Tales of the Hasidim, which speaks for this momentous occasion here at the WJC. Isaac, a Jew in Krakow, has a vivid dream. He dreams that a treasure is buried under a certain bridge in Prague he can't get it out of his mind. It's so vivid. So finally, he journeys to Prague. He finds the bridge that he saw in his dream. But it is guarded day and night. He goes every day and observes, trying to figure out how he's going to find the treasure that he dreamed of. 
finally one day the guard comes over to him, has been watching him, and says, what are you doing here? Isaac explains his dream to the guard. The guard laughs and says, huh, and I had a dream that in the home of some little Jew named Isaac in Prague, there's a treasure buried under his hearth. What am I supposed to do? There must be a thousand Jews named Isaac in Krakow. Even if the dream were true, how would I ever find this Isaac? Ridiculous. Dreams are, dreams are ridiculous. Isaac thanked the guard and hurried back to Krakow. There he dug under his hearth. The treasure had been waiting for him all along. I think Karen is a treasure, our treasure, from our own hearth, the Woodstock Jewish congregation and the Jewish people are blessed that Karen has chosen to become our rabbi. So now, our Beit Din is going to sign this document that is Karen's certificate of ordination. After we sign it, we are going to read it aloud so that you all can bear witness to it as well. And after we read it aloud, Cantor Rachel, who are also blessed to have in this community, is going to lead us all in the Birkat Kohanim, the priestly blessing which we're going to offer to Karen after that. And so, the first thing I'm going to ask is for each rabbi to come and sign this document while we observe.
now, um, I can move this table. We can just put it on the side. And I'm going to ask Karen to stand right here. I'm going to ask all of you to rise. And I'm going to ask the rabbis to place their hands. I'm going to read the first part. Oh, by the way, the Hebrew, the Hebrew translation is by my sister-in-law, Roberta Bell Quigler in Israel, who, Karen, on her many trips to Israel, was working on an archaeological dig near my sister-in-law's office, and they became very good friends. So there's also another family, beautiful family connection for me, too. This is to certify that whereas Karen Levine has over the past many years devoted herself to the sacred studies of the Holy Torah and its interpretations, whereas she experiences the inner essence of Torah and its manifold mysteries, whereas she bears a deep love for Jewish study and tradition, whereas she has ably led our Jewish community in the chanting of Torah, the leading of prayers, the care for our deceased, the comforting of our mourners, the visiting of our sick, the care of our sanctuary, and the training of our youth, whereas she is a person of emotional maturity and profound moral integrity, always striving to walk on the path of righteousness, creativity, and service. And whereas she has demonstrated her commitment to the well-being of the Jewish people here in Israel and around the world. And now we're all going to read this in unison. We, the undersigned, by the authority vested in us by the chain of rabbinic ordination, do hereby confirm, commission, and ordain her as rabbi to serve, to serve in the sacred capacities of teacher of Torah, leader of prayers, pastoral counselor, and spiritual and ethical guide with the right to officiate in all rabbinic matters. May Karen always draw sustenance, strength, and inspiration from her abiding connection to the source of life, our God. We are blessed to welcome her as our colleague and as a leader of the Jewish people. To this, we affix our signatures and seal. Ah, mazel tov. Rach, Cantor Rachel is going to lead us in the priestly blessing. So Rachel will sing, and I'll lead the response. I don't know. I don't know. Who 
Rabbi Karen Levine. One repays a teacher badly if one remains only a pupil. I heard this quote last week while managing the online production for the annual Young on the Hudson seminar for the New York Center for Jungian Studies. <laughs> it was mentioned by master teacher Christine Downing during her lecture about the relationship between Carl Gustav Jung and his teacher, Sigmund Freud. She was quoting Jung, who was quoting Nietzsche, one repays a teacher badly if one remains only a pupil. And so it is time for me to repay my teacher, Rabbi Jonathan Cliblow, <laughs> on whose shoulders I stand and whose legacy is now mine to carry forward. And it is also time to repay all of my teachers, my parents, Paul and Sandra Levine. How better to fulfill the commandment to, to honor one's father and mother than becoming a rabbi? Well, maybe becoming a doctor, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I married one, so it's, it's okay. And my other teachers, my teacher, my brother Michael, my sister Susan, my daughter, Alexandra, who is not with us today because she is in the wild somewhere in California, but she's with us in spirit. Mark, uh, my husband emeritus, you like that title? <laughs> <laughs> my sister Suzanne, who's here with me, my family, my friends, my congregants, my students. Here's that other, there you are. My bandmates, all of you. For as it says in the Talmud, who is wise? One who learns from everyone. As it is said in the Psalms, from all who have taught me, I have gained understanding. I stand here today with my nearly 65 years of study and learning to, in the best way possible, honor 
and repay all of you, my teachers. All right, a story. Once upon a time, on October 5th, 2023, to be precise, I was invited to lunch at the Garden Cafe here in Woodstock by two angels, Ruth Bile and Myra Schwartz. They were already seated when I arrived and quickly got to the point. Both were very smiley, gleeful almost, as they laid out their plan that I should be the next rabbi of Kehilat Lev Shalem, the Woodstock Jewish congregation. We were fresh out of the High Holy Day tent, and with our new four-woman clergy team on the bima, there was a lot of uncertainty about what these services would be like. To the relief of most who attended, including the service leaders, it was good. We got what we needed. The holy days worked their magic. And here we were on the most glorious golden early autumn day you can imagine, sitting in the garden, basking in the afterglow. Me, a rabbi, the rabbi? That was not in my plans. I was glad to be part of an interim clergy experiment while the congregation went back to the drawing board for a second year rabbi search. I was glad to know that I could be a competent service leader after so many years in supporting roles. But I was also proud to be a non-ordained spiritual leader as this felt most consistent with my anti-authoritarian feminist <laughs> sensibility. <laughs> the professional rabbinate was not something I'd ever aspired to nor sure I particularly believed in. So when Myra and Ruth shared their proposal with me, I listened graciously, I thanked them for their confidence in me, and then I explained all the reasons why it was not a practical solution. If nothing else, I would need to spend many years and many dollars on rabbinical school, potentially needing to relocate to do that. This would not solve Woodstock's immediate need for a rabbi but I was honored to be able to serve the congregation as part of the clergy team, and I looked forward to what the new year would bring. It was not an easy year, to say the least. Within two days of my lunch with Ruth and Myra, Hamas had attacked Israel, and the Jewish world was rocked to its core. Without recounting the details of what it was like to be a leader of a diverse Jewish community with many different and complicated relationships to Israel, it was hard. But I let my own passionate relationship with Israel and Israelis, my trust in the wisdom of Torah, and my need for sanctuary, especially for the calm, nurturing presence of Shabbat to be my guides. And I received many messages of gratitude from congregants who were grateful to be able to walk into this building and experience a desperately needed respite from the griefs and anxieties of world and national events. And then after another year of untold hours and disappointed expectations, we were again unsuccessful in hiring a new rabbi. In the meantime, as part of my role in serving on the clergy team, I was called to perform some funerals, both for members of our congregation and several outside the community. In each of these cases, mourners and guests would say, thank you, Rabbi. And I would say, you are most welcome. It is an honor to be here to serve you at this time. It felt a bit dishonest, but I did not say, but I'm not actually a rabbi. And this is where the door opened a crack. When I began to consider that maybe having the title would make it easier for people to understand my role and what I was bringing to them. And I approached Rabbi Jonathan for guidance on how best to move forward. He explained to me, as he did with you earlier this evening, that there is an older, more ancient process of receiving smicha of the passing on of Jewish leadership and authority. And in the most beautiful way that the universe lines up, it is in this week's Torah portion, in Parshat Pinchas, that Joshua receives smicha from Moses. 
that initiates a process that has persisted generation to generation to this day, to this day. It is awesome, awesome to experience myself now in that lineage. All right, back to our story. After the last of our rabbi candidates rejected the offer of a contract, and note that I had been waiting to see what was going to happen with regard to clergy for the coming year so that I would know what, if any, role I might have in the new landscape. Someone whose opinion I greatly respect said to me, you could do this job. I definitely had a year of tremendous growth, proving to myself at least that yes, I'm a competent service leader and I can offer a calm and comforting presence in some of the most challenging moments. So after a sleepless night, I called Ellie Kramer, then chair of the search committee and now president of our show, and offered my candidacy. She was a bit incredulous. This was not exactly what she had, uh, had previously considered, but she said she would bring it to the committee. Now as an aside, as we were planning today, she actually revealed that very early in our relationship, on the, if you remember this, on the Stairmasters of Fitness Unlimited in Kingston, New York, <laughs> one of her first impressions of me was, she would make a good rabbi. <laughs> and then I received a visit from two more angels, two men this time, who came to my tent, well, actually my backyard, as I sat in the heat of the afternoon to let me know that I'd be having a child in my old age. <laughs> well, not exactly. <laughs> but they said that the committee had seriously considered my offer and was prepared to move my candidacy forward. Was I serious and ready to step up? Or let me tell the story another way. There I was, enjoying a beautiful late May afternoon in my backyard when two men, Nathan Brenowitz and Ed Baum, came over to make me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> now, as another aside, Mario Puzo lived in Merrick, the town on Long Island where I grew up. And he wrote The Godfather while he was living in Merrick. And his son, Joseph, was in my second grade class. Second grade? Yeah. <laughs> and here we are today, <laughs> and I am more surprised than most of you. Who, when I told you that I was stepping up to become a rabbi and to potentially lead this congregation said, of course, this is who you are. This makes so much sense. You can do this. There has not been a more challenging time in my lifetime to be a Jewish leader. To say that this task I'm stepping into is daunting would be an understatement. But I'm as ready as I'll ever be. And I'm committed to do my part, to contribute to the work of tikkun olam, nurturing this committee, and healing the world. What better way to address the recent rise in anti-Semitism, for example, than to show up as a Jew carrying the wisdom of Torah and the compassion of chesed, of loving kindness, into some of the most difficult conversations. As my father said to me, as my parents were dropping me off from college, my freshman, dropping me off at college for my freshman year, said, get involved. <laughs> well, dad. <laughs> I, Jump into the water and get involved. So uh, here I am. I am getting involved. And as my mother has always said, the world needs you. OK, world, here I am. And what a blessing that we and we have reached this day together. And suddenly, I'm excited about what's going to happen next. It won't be easy, but I won't be bored. <laughs> it's a privilege to be called to serve people in often the most intimate of ways. Young Jews in their 20s, 30s, and 40s especially need compassionate, creative, thoughtful leadership at this painful,
confusing time. I will do my best, or as I have been assured by my friend Ed, more than my best, to be the teacher, the leader, the pastor that is needed. And so I am blessed to have this opportunity to repay my teachers with the fullness of my commitment to be the rabbi that it seems I have been training all my life to become. Before I conclude, I would like to thank a few people for their contributions to this day. And I know that this won't be everyone, but it's a start. Thank you, Rabbi Jonathan, for being my teacher and for convening this Beit Din. Thank you, Rabbi Ellen Trebwasser, who's been a great friend, a great teacher, a colleague, and a support for many years. Thank you, Rabbi Miriam Margols, Rabbi Karen Tashman, Rabbi Noya, each important special teachers for me. And thank you for traveling to be here on this sacred occasion. Thank you, Myra and Ruth. Where are you? There you are. Thank you, Myra. Thank you, Ruth. You planted that seed nine months ago. Look what the... <laughs> And their reward is that they got to organize the party that we're going to have <laughs> afterwards. So yes, there'll be a reception at the concluding of the program. We'll give a quick instruction about we're going to open the wall, we're going to move the chairs, we're going to bring up the tables. It'll all go fast. And then we'll hang out and party. Thank you to all the volunteers who have helped set up the chairs and decorate, especially Diane Colello. Diane, there you are. Thank you and for making my beautiful Pa. Special thank you to Elena Erber, who typeset the Smicha certificate. It is really beautiful. And we'll, we'll have it here on the piano if anybody wants to come and look at it. Thank you, Margo, who reminded me, of course, every gathering needs a clarinet. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to Bonnie and the choir, who you'll hear from in a few minutes. And thank you, Barbara Pickhart. And Ars Corrales, your presence is always my wish come true. Our tradition teaches that there are moments which coincide with significant religious observances and rituals and times of change in individual life status, like one gets, when one gets married or gives birth, or like today's ceremony. This is a time when the veil between the spiritual and the physical worlds is especially thin. And these times offer unique opportunities for blessing and for healing. And so I would like to offer you a blessing. Nishaberach avotenu Avraham Yitzchak Yaakov Bimotenu Sara, Rivka, Rachel, Valeya. May the one who bless our ancestors, our grandmothers and great grandmothers, our grandfathers and great grandfathers, bless you who are here today in this beautiful sanctuary, in sacred land in Woodstock, New York, and those who are joining us remotely. I'm so happy that you're here. May you be blessed with curiosity. Curiosity keeps us in the moment. Curiosity says, whatever is happening now, what is that? Curiosity doesn't judge. Curiosity doesn't fear. Curiosity says, yes, I'm here, and I I'm in it. I'm interested. And may your curiosity be tinged with a little bit of hope, right? Things are, can, can really get better. They really can. We can be surprised. Let's be surprised and curious for whatever is going to come next. 
can we say Amen? Thank you. Now our choir is going to serenade us and Karen with a piece by Judy Kerman called Shechina. Now for something that's not on the program, because I wanted to surprise Karen. Um, Ellen Yehoda, my wife Ellen and Karen have their own beautiful friendship. And Ellen's made a gift for Karen that she wants to present to her. Oh. 
Thank you. <clears throat> I have to give it to her first. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Okay, here's my notes. <laughs> so, Karen, this is a circular present. It's a picture of time as related circles of solar months and lunar months. And <clears throat> while I was making it as a gift for you, I received a gift myself from making it for you. The gift to me was very rabbinic, a boost in Jewish knowledge, strengthening of loving relationship, and a deepening of Jewish worldview. Thank you. <laughs> the gift lay specifically in asking Jonathan over and over to explain things and then in returning to the studio, the compass, the protractor, the tracing paper, the pens, the pencils, and the mysteries of circle geometry to make this physical representation of the answers to the questions. Karen knows all of this, <laughs> but I'll fill you in just a tiny bit. Judaism has always contained two New Year's, one in the spring and one in the fall. The fall one has taken precedence, and it is in the fall that we start with a new number for each year. But it is the spring new year that sets the calendar of 29 day long lunar months into accord with 30 and 31 day long solar months. And why is it important to set them in accordance at all? You of all people know <laughs> because not only the phases of the moon, but also the seasons of the sun are deeply integral to Jewish time. It is important for Tu B'Shvat to fall when the almond trees are beginning to bloom in Israel, and coincidentally when the maple sap is beginning to run in New York. It is important for Sukkot to fall at the beginning of the rainy season in Israel, and coincidentally, at the time of peak harvest in New York. So here are the wheels of the lunar year and the solar year that you can set. All the lectures about the hows and the whys and the history, not for now. <laughs> this moment is for another blessing for you. May the one who blessed our ancestors bless you. May you be blessed as you step into leadership and care of this congregation with your own ever deeper and ever richer circles of connection to Jewish time. Ellen made this talit also, just one say. Mm -hmm, that's right. My birthday has to be <laughs> And the wheels turn so that you can adjust it every year. Yeah. Isn't that cool? And I have something for you as well. I hope, it's not, I hope it's not a first edition copy of Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe Hanna's bat mitzvah was on Bloomsday, and that was her gift. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I have for you a yad, a oh. Torah yad from Israel. Oh. And I got it because of the quote on it. The quote is, Ase lecha rav ukne lecha chaver. That's from Pirkei Avot, uh, Yehoshua ben Parachia one of the rabbis in the chain of transmission in that book I cited earlier, 
would teach. Find thyself a teacher and acquire for yourself a colleague and comrade. And you can, and then you can also say, as I, this is why it grabbed me, because in addition, can mean make yourself, make someone a rabbi, which I just did. <laughs> and acquire a colleague. And the rest of that quote, which is very important, is Behevedan et kol ha'adam And when you judge anyone, tip the scale in their favor. And on the other side is your name, Rabbi Karen Levine, and the date. Wow. And so I want you to have that. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> and so, <sighs> How's that for good rabbinic wisdom? When you judge people, always tip the scale in their favor. And now we're going to give Karen yet one more blessing. If you would look on your program, this is called Tfilat HaDerech by Debbie Friedman, and it's for you. I, it's very simple, and then the chorus is Amen, and you'll be able to do that for sure. Here's how it goes. May you be blessed as you go on your way. May you be guided in peace. May you be blessed with health and joy. May this be our blessing. Amen. Amen, amen, may this be our blessing, amen. That's pretty easy. Amen, amen, may this be our blessing. Amen. And now for all of us. May we be sheltered by wings of peace. May we be kept in safety and love. May grace and compassion find their way to every heart. May this be our blessing. Amen. 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 May this be our blessing. Amen. And now we have the privilege of singers from Ars Chorales who've graced our sanctuary so many times, who are going to conclude our ceremony with Shalom Rav from the prayer book, a prayer for abundant peace. That's the only thing we're praying.
Thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined on Zoom. Zoom. And thank you everyone for being here. And I'm so looking forward to this next chapter in the congregation's life with Rabbi Karen Levine. Just the logistics, we're opening the walls, we'll move some chairs forward, and then the food tables can come forward and we'll set up some tables for people to sit and eat. And I hope you'll hang out and say hello. And thank you so much for being here. And there are some beverages, adult beverages and other beverages are actually outside on the front portico. Ah, so I've been redirected. Let's all go outside. We'll head out into the lobby, get a glass of wine, a glass of soda, and then we'll get the chairs out of the way. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. 